So, um, starting from this episode, I would like to um, to unfold a new topic that differs from the previous one, and that is what will happen to you if you are to be caught by the police in mainland China, and very unfortunately, if you are to be prosecuted for criminal offenses. And I deliberately choose not to use what you can do, but what will happen to you because. In reality, you probably won't be able to do much to help yourself. You know, in mainland China, the so-called connections, guan xi, is very important. They are everything. And if your case is not a political one, like picking quarrels and provoking trouble, or inciting some version, or inciting splitting the state, blah blah blah, or is inciting how extraordinary. I, I never knew that we Chinese are so good at inciting. But so, if your case is not a political one, you and your family might have a chance in using your connections. Of course, that means a large amount of money will be spent into bribery, but you have a chance to avoid this whole thing. And if your case is political, well, connections still work, but you have to find that to make your connections very solid, to find the connections that that connects with those figures that are ranked very high in the system, preferably at the top. Which is almost certainly not possible for ordinary people, and、um, I don't have such connections. And my case was a political one, therefore I have absolutely no idea how the connections will work. I reckon that they work differently. I mean, if you're a drug dealer, you have your own ways of getting yourself out of trouble. But that might differ from the ways of a smuggler or a telecom fraudster. So um again, my apologies. I really do not have such knowledge in those areas, and that is not the topic of this video. The topic, as I put here, is only to introduce this procedure. And the reason why I decide to make this video is that I have noticed that most Chinese citizens, even those who oppose the state government, that is to say the dissidents, have little or even no knowledge of such a procedure that they might have such a high risk of being forced to go through one day. And、uh, apologies also apply to my dreadful Chinese accent. As a native Chinese, I too cannot pronounce those Ws, Ls, or Rs well, or maybe the Ths and Ngs included. And I might stammer. I of course will try to delete them out in afterward editing. So in today's episode, I would like to talk about general judicial procedure from the moment that you were caught or summoned by the police to the day that you will be released. And by saying general, it implied that I'm not going to make an hour-long video. I hope not. That discussed every detail and exception, since you all know that mainland China is not so lawfully ruled. So, therefore, anything could happen in reality. So, first of all, the sources. Well, that's according to my own experiences, related laws of mainland China, and the experiences of others. That is, if they have published their experiences on the internet. And these are the laws that were referenced in this video. It's mainly the first two, or the first one actually. So the most important one is, that will be talked about today is the 刑事诉讼法 the criminal procedure law. And、uh, that the one with a very long title is, as its name implies, the interpretation of the criminal procedure law, in which many of the details that were not included in the criminal In the criminal procedure law, were stipulated there. Like, for example, how is one month calculated? How to define one month? Is it twenty-nine day or thirty day or thirty-one days?、Uh, that is defined in the interpretation. And what if the beginning or the end of the particular stage falls into the holiday? It's it's all in the interpretation. It is a mainland China tradition that after every revision of the criminal procedure law is made, an interpretation will follow in the next couple of years, and these two documents will be the will be the actual criminal procedure law in practice. And I reckon that there is no need to emphasize that mainland China is not such a place where the rule of law prevails, and they have specifically stated so, and very shamelessly, I might say. In early 2017, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court Zhou Tian claimed that the constitutionalism and the judicial independence are the evil weeds of the West. A claim that was reinforced by Xi Jinping in the next year, preaching to his to his own people that they should flash salt to the wrong salts of the judicial independence of the West. 
But I do want to point out that this is actually the new reality that has only come into being in recent years. Even back in 2015, when when I bought some books that were used for judicial examination preparation, I wasn't going to give it a go just for later reading. And in those textbooks, there was a whole chapter about judicial independence, its history, and how we, by saying we, is the law practitioner, practitioners, not me, in mainland China, could do to promote the realization of judicial independence. And there were indeed efforts and progress was made. During the years before this horrible statement of sword flashing, but all was gone, and the situation has deteriorated so drastically in such a short of period of time. But that's the dominant topic of this video too. I might make another video to discuss to discuss on this particular thing if I can actually, because that means a lot of research will be poured into it. And if you are going to have a taste of mainland China's judicial procedure, you might probably. Here, this phrase that contains three characters, Gong, Jian, and Fa, the public security organs, the prosecution organs, and the courts. They are the three main consecutive phases that a criminal case, in most cases, should go through one by one. The first one, Gong, stands for public security organs. That, at the very top, lies the Ministry of Public Security, Gong An Bu. And under that, there are public security departments, Gongantian, and public security bureaus, Gongantju, branches of public bureaus, Gongantfengju, and at the very bottom, the police stations or the police posts, Paichuso. The names in public security police system do not strictly stick into the administrative levels; they are sticking with the apparent names, not the actual administrative level of the police. So, for example, Beijing is a municipality that ranked as a provincial division. However, it is public security bureau that was established in Beijing, not a public security department. Only those provinces and the so-called autonomous regions that can have their public security departments. For example, Hebei Shan Gongantian, the public security department of Hebei Province. It sometimes can be a little bit confusing for that some county-level cities, yes, it's county-level cities, will have their own public security bureaus. At the same time, some county-level cities will only get their branches of the upper PSB. It's actually a total messed up. And if you do talk with the police, with a police officer, the, that they might also call the Ministry of the Public Security at the very top a bureau. Yes, they, that's true. The police will say that it, this is a Ministry Bureau, 布局 So it's it's very messed up. The Ministry of Public Security and its subordinate constitute the main component of the investigation agency. That is to say, there are other organs that can take part in criminal investigation, including the so-called People's Procuratorates, which I will talk about it right away, and the State Security Organs, Guoan, which I'll compare it with the Public Security Organs and the Domestic Security Guards, Guobao, in the next slide. You you're most likely to be investigated by the public security organs, though you can be involved in investigations that are carried out by the state security organs. But it's very rare, and if unfortunately you are, then in most cases that means that you are in serious troubles, and you probably will be forced into disappearance before too long. And here comes the second word, Jian, the prosecution organs, meaning the four-tier so-called people's procuratorates, located at the first three levels of the administrative divisions. The prosecution organs are more straightforward than the hierarchy of the public security organ and the courts, which will be introduced later on. There's the supreme procuratorate at the top, a provincial procuratorate at every provincial division, normally called something like Jiangsu Xiang Renmin Jian Cha Yuan, the People's Procuratorate of Jiangsu Province, and prefectural ones that named something like 
福州市人民检察院 ，the People's Procuratorate of Fuzhou and County Level Ones, like Lubei Chu Renmin Jiancheng Yuan, the People's Procuratorate of Lubei District of Tian Tangshan, it Tangshan, right? Not Tianjin Tangshan. And to bear in mind that the administrative divisions are far more complicated than Sheng Shi and Chu provinces, cities, and districts. There are lots of More detailed ones are there, and as long as they are ranked above the county level, they will get their own procuratorate. I want to emphasize that here in the ranks of the prosecution organs, the hierarchy of the procuratorate strictly sticks to the hierarchy of the administrative levels, and that is because they are sticking with the courts, even though they do not use the. Hierarchical adjective in their names, just like the court do. That is apart from the supreme procuratorate. There's a supreme there, but there's no high, intermediate, or primary procuratorate. Just provincial procuratorate, Shenjian, city procuratorate, Shijian, and district procuratorate, Qujian. But the structure and the actual level of the procuratorate is actually defined by the administrative tiers. And here comes to the last far the courts. The courts have a similar four-tier hierarchy as the procuratorate, and finally they started to use hierarchical adjectives to denote their tiers. So therefore, we've got the Supreme Court as a top, and each provincial division has got its high court, including those municipalities which rank as a provincial division, like Beijing, for example, has its own high court. And intermediate courts under that, and right down at the bottom, the primary courts, which for some unknown reason, suddenly changed their name and tradition, not to show their ranks, but to name simply after the district's name. But they are primary courts in definition. So therefore, for example, there is a Fujian Shang Gao Ji Renmin Fa Yuan, the Fujian High People's Court. And under that, there is the Quanzhou Shi Zhongji Renmin Fa Yuan, the Quanzhou Intermediate People's Court. And right under that, there is the Licheng Chu Renmin Fa Yuan, the Licheng District People's Court. Please note that there are other courts, other courts and uh, uh, tribunals that do exist, including six circuit courts under the Supreme Court and eleven maritime courts, several intellectual proper- property tribunals. And internet tribunals, but they are a little bit irrelevant to today's topic because the Supreme Court and its six circuit courts do not take appeals from the criminal case, or the intellectual property tribunals, inter- internet tribunals, and、uh, financial tribunals, and、uh, the international commercial courts do not take criminal cases at all. The maritime courts, however, do take criminal cases, but only in very rare circumstances. Very rare, like one in a couple of years. Most criminal cases that involve maritime regulations will end up being heard in an ordinary court, and those railway transportation courts, forest mining, or、uh, the reclamation area courts do not take. Uh, do take they do take criminal cases, but they can be treated as some special division level courts, just like other primary or intermediate courts, and they ranked as the levels accordingly too. So once your case has finished investigation, which may last for months, I'll talk about that in、uh, in details later, and your case file has been transferred to the prosecution organs. The procuratorate will then take the responsibility to examine your case and then pass your case with an indictment to the court at the same level. Cases will be prosecuted by primary or intermediate procuratorates, and if a case is heard and decided by the primary court for the first instance, an appeal can be filed with the upper court. In this case, it's the intermediate court, and if a case is first heard and decided by an Intermediate court an appeal can be filed to the high court. In mainland China, cases can only be tried twice, but it's actually a little bit, a little more complicated than that, and I'll talk about it later. 
Now let's divert the topic a little bit further into the differences between Gong An, Guo An, and Guo Bao. First of all, all of them are police, but only Gong An, the public security police, are what is most commonly perceived as the police. The Guo An's, under the administration of the Ministry of State Security, are the secret police that, like their Russian counterpart, the FSB, or KGB in the past, or the Staatssicherheit in East Germany, they deal with the so-called state security-related cases, and you'll be in serious trouble, as I've said, if you are to be face them instead of a public security police. Articles 102 to 113 of the criminal law stipulated the acts and conduct considered as state security crimes. And yet, not all the cases that would be prosecuted under these articles are taken by the Guan, the state security police. In fact, only a very small portion of state security cases will be investigated by the Guan police, most notably if the suspect is reckoned as a foreign spy, even though they, they tend to have a very different definition of what a spy is, if come to that, and that might be a very good topic for another video. Here, to tell the long story short, if you are an overseas Chinese, and if you are involved in anti-CCP activities inside, inside mainland China, you have a very high risk of being reckoned as a spy. And many of the suspects, that is, mainland Chinese nationals, who are charged with subversion or inciting subversion, were caught and interrogated by ordinary public security police and were detained in ordinary detention centers before trial. Only in very rare and unfortunate circumstances will you, a Chinese citizen, be taken away by Guan and then be detained in their own Guan Khan, the state security detention centers managed directly by the state security department in every provincial division. Yes, it's one in every provincial division. The Ministry of State Security has a similar hierarchical structure to the Ministry of Public Security, which means that there are state security departments in provinces and state security bureaus in cities. But after that, I cannot be sure if there's any further subordinate. And uh, finishing the investigation, after the finishing the investigation, the cases handled by the state security organs will also need to be transferred to the procuratorate to be prosecuted. And the Guo Bao, Guo Bao, however, also they sharing the same character Guo, which means state. Guo Bao, however, is actually the least powerful one. They are the political police with without real power. Their official name was Guanei Anquan Bao Wei, which stands for Domestic Security Guard, but was changed to Zheng Zhi Anquan Bao Wei, Political Security Guard, in 2020. So now they should actually be called Zheng Bao. Their duty is to keep an eye on the dissidents, and they do all the dirty work of surveillance, harassment, or even beating beating the involved person directly in some reports. But they cannot, they cannot handle cases independently. There's still one organ that is often forgotten, and that is a justice organ. The justice organs, they take the burden of running and managing prisons throughout the country, except for one, the famous Qingcheng prison. That, that one is under the direct administration of the Ministry of Public Security. The justice organs share a similar or even the very same five-tier hierarchical structure as public security organs, where the Ministry of Justice comes at the very top and the sub-district or township-level justice posts at the very bottom. Apart from prisons, those so-called drug rehabilitation centers are also under the administration of the justice organs, as well as those who are on parole. So to sum up, an ordinary criminal case will first be interrogated and investigated by the police, most commonly the public security police, and yet it may fall into the hands of a state security police in certain cases. And meanwhile, the suspect, after being interrogated at what usually would be the police station or police post, 
will be sent to a detention center run by the local public security organ, with exceptions existing, and we'll talk about that later. After months of the so-called comprehensive investigation, the public security organ will then file the case with its case file, together with a document named Opinions on Prosecution, 起诉意见书 to the corresponding procuratorate. The procuratorate, after receiving the case, will then examine the case files and compose a formal indictment, which will be normally eerily similar to the document provided by the public security organ. Since they just often copied from the first one to the next, and then to the next, and then to the next, sometimes a typo that existed in the very first document, the request for the approval of arrest, 提请批准逮捕书 will be passed all the way through to the final judgment. The procuratorate then will file the case with the corresponding court, and the latter will then choose a date for the court hearing and then draw the judgment. After the defendant's chance for appeal has been exhausted, which can be easily done, or if the defendant chooses not to file an appeal, an execution order will then follow sooner or later. And upon the detention center receiving the execution order, if the then convicted criminal, their remaining term of imprisonment is longer than three months, they will be transferred to prison in in batches, not one by one, but in batches. Otherwise, they will serve their remaining term in the detention center. So, with all these backgrounds, we can finally back to the topic, and that is to explain this whole procedure. So, suppose your name is Johnson, and you have been participating in some activities that the regime really does not like. It, for example, posting your own opinions on the internet that do not agree with the mainstream ideology. Or spreading facts that are perceived by the authorities as rumors, or even if you are so unpardonable that you dare to create a website to put your own essays of anti-party, anti-socialism on it, which is the exactly circumstances in the case of Xu Zhiyong, if you have ever heard of, then you are here, prepared to start a brand new adventure, and. To be fair, if you are not some anti-CCP celebrity, or if you have not already caused some little hiccup on the internet, your encounter with the police might not come so soon. There probably won't be someone knocking at the door the next day after you have posted something that had not sparked a brouhaha on the internet. But as Xi Jinping once said, "There's a ledger." And all have been recorded. You guys are all so happy today, making a fuss with me. But be careful; you will all be cleared in the future. And he continues with something like, "There's a god, or there's god, there's gods three feet over your head," which is very funny. But that's true. Some most unfortunate guy I ever met in the detention center was detained and later sentenced to a fixed term imprisonment for what he had done. You know. What he had retweeted in a private Twitter account that the whole account was deleted almost over one years before. Yes, you you heard it right. His Twitter account involved was deleted, and after several months of tranquil life he spent, he was caught for what he had retweeted in that deleted account. So bear in mind, there's a ledger. And your karmas will be cleared someday. So here we are, a sunny day outside with zephyr breezing, and you are ready to start this journey. What's the first step? Well, that depends. You may be summoned by a telephone call, or be summoned with a written notice. That is called the summons, 传唤证 That is often the summons that is often sent to you by hand. At your door, and by the very police officer that will take you away. There may not be any written notice at all, but if the police officer is at your door, you still be taken away. Sometimes they will come with a search warrant, 搜查证 that happens in my case, and they probably won't really carry out a search, just take you and your electronic devices back to the police station. And starting from this point, I will show the mocked legal document as the. Procedure furthers, as as the name suggests that these documents are mocked or simulated 
imitated legal document with a fake identity of the defendant, a fake case that happened in a fake place in a fake province that no longer exists. That is, apart from the layout and the format of the document, everything is fake, but it will look very real. And by saying the word same, I mean this mocked one on the left is the same as the real one on the right. The right one is mine, so I can show it to you here. Apart from the content that should vary from case to case, that is, the issuing authority, the citation, the faked identity and the faked place, the stamps, for instance, all the other elements, the format, the layouts and the content would be the very same. And uh, I chose not to fake the stamps because in case there would be some legal problems. Instead, I will use the red text to denote that there would be an official seal stamped at the very place. And besides every mock document, there will be some small dots like this on the left or on the right, and it denotes some of the properties of the document, like whether you can keep the copy of or not, or whether this document that you should be sent to will be sent to or not. So the blue dot with a dark blue circle means that it is a document that you or your family or lawyer can keep a copy of in the same format and content as a mocked one here. And if the auto circle turns light blue, that means that it will be a document that will be given to you or your family or lawyer to sign it in the same format and content as a mocked one, but cannot be kept a copy of. And if the color turned green, it means that I can only assume that a similar document should exist, very similar in the format and layout, but should be something little different, and it should be sent to you or your lawyer or your family to sign or keep. And letters in the dots showed who should receive this document. The traffic light dot, on the other hand, only denote that in reality you, the detainee or the defendant, right, in the detention center, have how large the possibility to actually receive it. Here it only means you, not your family or your defender, since they will often miss most of the notices and documents in most cases, with only the most important ones, like the indictment or the judgment, that will be sent to them. Okay, so let's go back to the summons or the search warrant that you may receive. Bear in mind that you will have a very high possibility that you won't receive anything. They'll just knock on the door and take you away. But if you are to receive anything, then there's something worth noticing about. I'll put the search warrant first because I just want to show you this quickly. The search warrant will look like this with your address on the paper, not your name. But don't be fooled. It is you. It is you that they are after. They know perfectly well who lived in your flat. And then there comes the summons. There are actually two types of summons. One is an administrative summons and one is a criminal summons. They look very similar to each other, therefore you have to look it carefully. The administrative summons looked like this. And the criminal ones look like this. The first difference is the citation. The administrative ones come with Xing Chuan, but the criminal ones are Chuan Huan. And the tone of the wordings is a little bit different with, I don't know why, but the administrative ones sound a little bit harsher than the criminal one. Despite in reality, we all know that the latter almost certainly would lead to a, an outcome that is not so good. So um, if you receive a criminal summons, you'd better find a chance to inform your friend or your family, since you might not be able to walk free out of the police station you are being taken to. The search warrant is also an alarm sign, since if they are not serious, they will not be bothered to go through the formalities to get one. But if your identity is extremely sensitive and the police have some reasons that they reckon that if they just turn up at your door and you'll be alerted and have the chance to destroy the evidence, they might 
choose to appear in an unexpected way to catch you. And by saying the word unexpected, it literally means that the ways they choose you cannot expect. In some of the cases, um, like in the case of an activist who was caught last year in southern China, the local police abetted some little tykes to romp very loudly outside the activist's flat. And after drawing the attention of the activist, the children who were playing then started to show some signs of as they, as if they were going to paint on the activist's car. Anger in their chest, the activist ran off the flat, prepared to have a little talk with the little kids, yet only to find themselves being pushed down to the ground by the police officers ambushing around. Therefore, if they want to do it in an unexpected way, they really can. And these summonses or search warrant might actually be a good sign in that they imply that your case is not a sensitive one, or not that sensitive. Of course, compared to no documents at all on a telephone call summoning, your chance of walking out free with these documents already prepared is slim. But if they come with documents, not with tricks and traps, the chance of you being forced into disappearance is also slim too. So arriving at the police station, you'll be interrogated. There will also be two types of the interrogation rooms. The normal one, that often you'll be seated in a chair, but you can still move your legs and arms. And the criminal interrogation room, where you'll be placed in what is called an iron chair, with your wrists and ankles being fixed to the chair, so that you cannot move anymore. If you are summoned by the criminal summons, then you go directly to the criminal interrogation room to do a criminal interrogation. If you are in the normal one, you have a chance to be just fined or be given some days of the so-called administrative de detention under the, under the law on penalties for administration of public security that normally will only last a few days. You may also be transferred to the criminal interrogation room after being interrogated in the normal, in the non-criminal one, which means that your case has now become a criminal one, and you have to be prepared to finish the whole journey. But bear in mind that the Chinese laws do not follow the doctrine of non bis in idem, which means that you might find yourself being brought back to the starting point once again, and this time facing a criminal charge. If your case is a political one and a few days of detention cannot please the hidden superior, then it will happen to you. There are many cases um, I met that happened in this way, with the unfortunate guys recapturing after they were released from administrative detention. The window period before the recapture varied, as far as I can gather, that varied from one month or almost a year. If you are not a political vendor but indeed had done something wrong in the past, and if your local police need someone or something urgently, an urgent case, to fill in their quota of the so-called Sorry Chugge, the special campaign on eliminating mob forces and eradicating local despots, then you may also find yourself being recaptured and re-prosecuted for something that you had done and had been jailed for years ago. But this time you face a much longer sentence. And uh, that's another story to tell. A question that is often asked is that will you be beaten during the interrogation? Well, you'll probably not be beaten if you are not a thief, a smuggler, or a drug dealer. These three types of suspects are most likely to go through severe torture that goes far beyond what can be defined as being beaten. Thieves, smugglers, and drug dealers that I met in the detention center all told me about their experiences of how badly that they were tortured during the interrogation. It's all of them, not even one of them, can escape the fate of being tortured. Some would still carry festering wounds that often caused by burning, burning by the lighters on their arms or hands, or electrifying. 
those wounds on their skin were still black and festering, even when they have already transferred to the detention center for over a month. The reason for this is that the police really need them to confess. They were the smugglers and drug dealers. Well, they will obviously carry out their acts in secret, and the police are always concerned that they still have something concealed to themselves. The situation, however, will be very much different when it comes to political offenders. On the one hand, the police officers sometimes do not even bother to hear your confession. The things you've done were many in public. That is different to the things that of the smugglers or drug dealers, and that is what you aimed at, right? You cannot, for example, you cannot write an essay eloquently that isn't viewable to yourself. Or protest valiantly in a secret place that no one knows, or hang up the clothes with a full of anti-CCP slogans in a closet in your own flat. So, therefore, the things you've done were probably already been photoed, recorded, or captured by the by the police as evidence. You never know how many police officers are under disguise in reality, every day, everywhere, on the streets or on the internet. You just cannot imagine. And they've probably already got all the evidence they need before questioning you, and what they say, which often comes from their superior or even the MPS at the very top. Yes, a large portion of internet cases are coming from some small group in the MPS directly. So what they say will become the ascertained fact in the final judgment. As I've mentioned earlier, the guy was sentenced to imprisonment for a Twitter account that no longer even exists. Therefore, they couldn't care less whether you confess or not. The political cases have gone truly political these days. You know, in a normal way, the police officers not only have to gather the facts of the crime that was committed, but they also have to find out the motives, which is why the criminal did that. But this can be omitted now in political cases, and if you read the recent judgments of political cases carefully,、um, but you can't, right? They won't make them public now. But if you can read them somehow, you find that in these judgments the motives were omitted. They just don't bother to write that part, which they should. This won't happen in other normal cases. On the other hand, since most political offenders do not reckon that they had done anything wrong, they might be. In such a mood that they very much like to talk. At least I was, since I absolutely did not reckon that I was wrong. I can talk about everything with a police officer openly and squarely, with nothing to hide. So the physical torture might not apply to political offenders, as long as you do not confront the police deliberately. Now, after your first round of interrogation, especially when it was carried out in the normal interrogation room. If it is a case of our Johnson story, that is, if you are considered a political offender, you might be released for the time being, and you might be able to go home. But as long as you are not given back your electronic devices, no matter what the excuse is being used by the police officer to comfort you, you must not reckon that everything is over and your life has come back normal again or is going back to normal. No. Quite the contrary, you'll definitely be summoned to the police station in the following days to go for another round or rounds of interrogation. It is not very common among other types of suspects, probably because the police station reckon that police offenders will not run off or do not have the knowledge of knowing how to run off. Especially when where you live has been put under the draconian lockdown, which happens all the time these days. But in most cases, especially when you have stepped into the criminal interrogation room, the next time you can walk freely into the outside will be the day you are released after serving your full term. If the interrogation cannot be finished in one round, as far as I know, that some will be locked into special cages, or some will just be fixed to the iron chair that with using handcuffs. These days, the common practice of police is to finish all the interrogation that they need before transferring you to the detention center. That is because the formalities of carrying out interrogations inside the detention center have become a little bit complicated due to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Therefore, you might be staying at the police station a little bit longer, as far as I've heard, most commonly for a week or two weeks. Since the police officers will try their best to avoid the prospect of applying further interrogations in the detention center once you are transferred there. And please note that you have no right to require your lawyer's presence while you are interrogated, even though there's also no articles in the laws that prohibited that. But in China, you know, asking for the lawyer's presence will. And this man was beaten just because he dared to ask for legal aid. But since you are going to be detained in the detention center, you or your immediate family should better start finding at least one lawyer to represent you as your defense counsel. According to Article 34 of the Criminal Procedure Law, you have the right to appoint a defender yourself. But in reality, if you don't have done this before you are captured, you can't. And from this point, I repeatedly using the the combination of according to Article blah 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 and but in reality. Because from now on, the, there will be a huge gap between what is stipulated in laws and what is practiced in real life. It is recommended that you find yourself a lawyer at this point for some reasons. Firstly, you soon be transferred to the detention center and will be staying there for a very long time. That is, most in most cases, at least six or seven months, and it can be stretched to a couple of years. And during this time, your lawyer will be the only person that you may be meeting with, even though it is explicitly stipulated in laws that, as a detainee, you have the right to correspond and meet with relatives, counsel, or other defenders according to law. But in most of the detention centers, especially in northern China, your lawyer will be your only hope. No corresponding or other meetings can be made. I've heard. That in some southern provinces, that corresponding is allowed in some detention centers, and some even allow the detainees to meet with their families. But such law-abiding practice has not yet been extended to the whole country. So having a lawyer will allow you to make limited contact with your family in most parts of mainland China. And even this tiny right has been curtailed or even denied in recent years with the excuse of COVID-19 pandemic. I myself am an example. In 2020, I was denied to meet with my lawyer for the first 85 days since I was transferred to the detention center. And secondly, um, the second reason why you should get yourself a lawyer is that your lawyer can act as your legal representative to apply for a so-called release on bail, 取保候审 And this is very important because, in reality, those who can get a release on bail are those who will have a great chance of being granted a suspension of their sentence. In fact, you can only get the approval of bail if the case handling organ. Here, it can be the public security organ during the investigation period, or the prosecution organ during the short period of consideration on whether to approve your arrest or not, or during the examination and prosecution period, or the court after taking over your case from the prosecution. If only the organ reckons that you may be granted with suspension in the end, will they give you the bail? The judges at that time might be wrong, and you might be brought back to the detention center. Not only that, keep trying to apply for the release on bail at every stage. Actually, works in a way of negotiating with the involved parties in the whole procedure, that like nagging them to consider the possibility of the suspension, which you might be rightfully eligible to, yet often being neglected. Of course, if the crime you committed has a minimum sentence that is longer than three years, then the attempts trying to bail out can be dropped, since there's no way to get a suspension if your expected sentence is longer than three years, and therefore there's no use trying to get a release on bail. But if you or your family have some special connections, 
Well, you might still be bailed out for a while to enjoy your last days of freedom. I've seen some cases of that. It is notable that political offenders will normally not be granted with suspension, nor can they manage to get a bail out. But that's not a 100% sure thing, and there are successful cases, even very few, but it is still worth trying. But getting a release on bail cannot guarantee that you'll be granted with a suspension in the end. It just shows that the body that gave you the bail reckoned that you get a suspension. As I've said, their judge at that time could be wrong. And if the court reckons that you won't get away with incarceration, your bail will be revoked sometime before your court hearing and you'll be sent back to the detention center. Therefore, keep working on your connections, that is, your guanxi with your local prosecution and courts to secure what you are expected suspension. Okay, so back on our timeline. So at this point, you finished all the criminal interrogations and are about to be transferred to the detention center. A series of formalities will then follow, starting with you being handcuffed and being taken back to the crime thing to take photos. And that is called the crime thing identification. In Zhang San's case, you may be taken back to your flat to take photos with you pointing at your laptop or your mobile phone, and that happened in my case, then you'll be taken to your local hospital to carry out some physical examinations. You'll probably also be taken to different public security departments hidden in your city with a long name that I cannot precisely recount to get your, get your past causes of movement, your communication logs, to get these records print out. And after all these are done, you'll be transferred to somewhere called Case Handling Center, Ban An Zhongxin, to finish your final formalities before being transferred to the detention center. Some cities or counties may not have one of those, the Case Handling Center, Ban An Zhongxin, which means that the burden of the final formalities and the transfer will continue to fall on the shoulders of the police officers that caught you. In the case handling center, your biometric data will be collected to the police database, including your DNA, your fingerprints, your palm prints, your voice prints, your iris, your facial characteristics, and, of course, height and weight. At or around this point, you receive probably your first legal document, the detention warrant. That's right, the detention warrant, Zhang, not the arrest warrant, Zhang. And it looked like this. Liu Zheng, the detention warrant, not this one, the Liu Tongzhi Shu notice of detention. This is what is supposed to be received by your family, but often gone lost without a trace. You cannot keep the detention warrant, however, it will be taken back once you sign it, and there's no third copy for you to keep off. Some may also receive a notice of changing the term of criminal custody to extend your criminal detention to 30 days. In most cases, you won't receive this, but the term will still be lengthened. And that is because, under Article 91 of the Criminal Procedure Law, the public security organ shall file a request with the procuratorate for an arrest warrant within three days after the suspect is detained. The time limit may be extended for one to four days if there are special circumstances. The very article continues to regulate that only the person strongly suspected of committing a crime from place to place repeatedly or in a gang the time limit for requesting a arrest warrant can be extended to 30 days. But in reality, most of the detainees will get their criminal detention extended to 30 days right away as the day they were detained, including me, with an arbitrary choosing excuse. For example, in my case, they fill the field for reasons with committing the crime repeatedly. This has long become the typical practice in mainland China, no matter whether the case is truly that complicated or not.
and most of the detainees would not even give in the notice. And now you are in the detention center, an unforgettable experience that will at least last for several months, or worse, several years. I talked about the life inside the detention center in another episode, possibly the next one, but in this episode, let's focus on the procedure, not the detention center experiences. So you start your detention center life with criminal detention, which for most cases, your criminal detention is unlawfully extended from 3 to 7 days to 30 days. And during this period of time, before the pandemic, you probably meet with the police officer that dealt with your case several times inside the detention center because they may continue to ask you questions. And this section is called pick up interrogation, Tishen. It is not very common after the pandemic begins, since, as I've said, that the formalities have become very complicated for them. But if there is a real need to do this, then this will still happen. However, another form of interrogation after you've been transferred, which in the name of takeaway interrogation, Tiwaishen, to temporarily take you out of the detention center, has become almost extinct, except for very rare cases, which is a good sign, since Tiwaishen, take away interrogation, will almost certainly that foreshadows a miserable prospect of physical torture. At the end of this period, the police security organ dealing with your case will file a legal document named Request for the Approval of Arrest, with the corresponding procuratorate. This one you cannot see, therefore there is no illustration that can be drawn. Then your case will enter a short stage of seven days with no official name. Your case file will be temporarily transferred to the prosecution organ, and the prosecution organ then shall carry out an interrogation with you inside the detention center in the form of Tishen, pick-up interrogation, as I've just introduced. Since the procuratorate will conduct two interrogations in the whole procedure, it is therefore called Yijian, the first interrogation in the detention center. However, that's not a formal name. And currently, since the pandemic, this Yijian has been replaced by some pieces of paper named Form of Hearing the Opinions of the Suspect, the Tian Chu Fan Zui Xian Yi Ren Yi Jian Shu, at least in some areas, which is an irregular document with no fixed format that I can give. It's very informal actually, and sometimes it's just a formality thing. You see, since this is supposed to help them to decide whether or not to approve the rest, this step should be done before the arrest warrant is issued. But in reality, many will not receive this at all. Or, as in my case, I received this piece of sheet 23 days later after receiving the arrest warrant. But with or without being interrogated by, by the prosecution organ or being sent with that formality form, your arrest warrant, Dai Bu Zheng, is finally on its way. At this point, you are formally under arrest, and this is called Pi Bu. These 37 days are often considered to be the golden period for you and your family and your lawyer to try every method that you can to bail you out. As I've explained before, as I've explained before, Bailing you out will imply that you have a great chance of being granted a suspension if eventually convicted. And this is the best period to do so for that if you can successfully bail yourself out before the issuing of an arrest warrant, you have a slim chance of not even being prosecuted. That is, your case will be dropped in about a year with no any consequences. But keep in mind that to bail you out at this point cannot guarantee anything. You may have to finish the whole procedure, ending up with a suspension on your sentence. You may not be prosecuted if you are extremely lucky, 
or you may be brought back to the detention center somewhere that before your court hearing and facing an unavoidable prison life. All is possible, and no one can give you their word of which outcome is more possible than others. After this period, however, bailing out will become harder and harder by stages. But the later the stage that you manage to get yourself built out, the greater the possibility of you get a suspension. And this is what the arrest warrant, Dai Bu Zheng, looks like. And although the longest time limit in law for an arrest warrant is, is to be issued within 33 days, the time you receive one, you actually receive one in reality, will probably be longer or even much longer than that. For example, I received my arrest warrant on the 44th day since the day I was detained. The guy who was prosecuted for the long deleted Twitter account that I mentioned earlier received his arrest warrant on the 53rd day. And the longest I met was one I met in the detention center who was accused of committing the crime of forgery. He received his arrest warrant on the 68th day. And the longest I've heard is over 90 days. By the date of issue that printed on the document you received will all perfectly fall within the lawful time limit. And you'll be prohibited from writing down the true date that you receive it when they ask you to sign it. And even though you insist on signing with the correct date, and even if you manage to do so, as I did, but sorry to disappoint you, no legal effects are binding to it. Since the case files will not be public, they can still write whatever they want in the indictment, in the judgment, and rest assured, all the dates that appear in those documents will be absolutely decent and lawful. And this is what your family shall receive, the Dai Bu Tong Zhi Shu, Notice of Arrest, very simple one. But let's divert ourselves a little bit to travel to the parallel universe where that Johnson is more unfortunate than this current one. And that is the infamous RSDL, Residential Surveillance at a Designated Location, You can be put under RSDL at or between these two points, but in most cases, you'll be put on the ISTL either right after your criminal interrogation or after you have been criminally detained for about one month. The ISTL is, according to some who have experienced it, extremely dreadful and horrible. There are many reports or books that you can find if you are interested in this topic. It is worth pointing out that ISTL has been widely abused because Article 75 of Criminal Procedure Law has explicitly stipulated that only if 1. the suspect has no fixed abode, or 2. the suspect is suspected of committing a crime that endangers state security or involves terrorist activities that may the suspect be put under ISDL. But in reality, especially when you are considered a political offender, you have a higher than normal chance of being put under ISDL no matter what they charge you with. And speaking of state security related cases, as I have said before, you do not need to be interrogated by the state security police to be considered as a state security suspect, as long as they use crimes that stipulated under Articles 102 to 100 and 13 to charge you, including the most infamous one, inciting subversion of the state power, Shandong Dianfu Guojia Zhengquan, under paragraph 2 of article 105. And if that is the case, that is, you were charged with these articles, then there will be some consequences. First of all, you'll be more likely to be put under ISDL, like I just said, and secondly, your right to meet with a lawyer will be further curtailed, if not deprived. Because according to Article 39 of the Criminal Procedure Law, if your case is considered state security related, 
Your lawyer must make an application for the meeting with your investigation agency, and the latter can turn down the application for excuses like meeting with you will hinder the investigation. And thirdly, if your case is considered state security endangering, there might be no notice for your family of you being detained. As Article 85 of the Criminal Procedure Law regulates, if noticing your family will hinder the investigation, then there will be no notification at all. And this is a document that you shall receive if you are to be put under RSDL, the Jian Shi Ju Zhu Jue Ding Shu, Decision of Residential Surveillance. And this is what it will look like if it comes from the SSB, which I do hope you won't face this piece of paper one day. And this is a notice that should be sent to your family. This one is from the PSB, which with other similar notices that should come from the SSB or the prosecution as well, if you are to put under ISDL by them. And as I've just said, if your case is considered security related, your lawyer might receive a notice of not granting permission to them to meet with you, which looks like this. This is called 不准与会见犯罪嫌疑人决定书 decision on not granting permission to meet with criminal suspect. But the regime has been using this pandemic as an excuse to block lawyer meetings for for every detainees, actually, even though nowadays your lawyer will just function as a messenger between you and your family. As I've said earlier that I met my lawyer through voice call for the first time on the 85th day since I was detained. It was extremely hard and complicated for my lawyer to apply for a virtual meeting with many ridiculous conditions to be met back then. I hope they will make some improvement to this procedure, but I doubt it. Instead, let's hope the lawyers are now accustomed to those unreasonable regulations because that's more practical. Now, let's say that our Zhang San, remember Zhang San, has not been so unfortunately trapped in that parallel universe and has not been put on the ISDL. And yet, neither has he su- successfully built himself out. He is still stranded in the detention center, receiving his arrest warrant and waiting for the next step. So, what is the next step? Well, your case file will return to the police station and you now come into the stage that is called investigation detention, where, according to law, your case is being comprehensively investigated. And according to Article 156 of the Criminal Procedure Law, this period shall not exceed two months. But in the same article, it continued with If the case is complicated, it may be extended for one month upon the approval of the upper procuratorate. Furthermore, on the Article 158, it may be extended for two months if the approval was granted by the provincial procuratorate. And it continued with Article 159, if the suspect might face a fixed term imprisonment for more than 10 years, Another two months extension may be granted if approved by the provincial procuratorate again. And finally, there's Article 157, which states that if, for exceptional reasons, the case is not appropriate to be tried in the foreseeable future for a considerable long period of time, a special extension may be granted by the Supreme Procuratorate upon the approval of the Standing Committee of the NPC. So, theoretically, this originally two-month-long period can be extended to three months, four months, six months, or even whatever they want. But in practice, the public security organs very rarely will choose to extend this period, not if they are really investigating and the time allocated is truly not that enough. If they want to procrastinate, they will put you on the ISDL in the first place, or according to Article 67 of the Criminal Procedure Law, 
you can be transferred to RSDL when your detention period is expired if your case still needs to be investigated further. But that is only theoretically. I have never seen anyone being transferred to RSDL after the investigation detention. And if they are to extend this period, you should be sent with a notification notifying you that your term of custody is to be extended, which will look like this. 延长侦查羁押期限通知书 Notice of extension of the term of investigation custody. It, it should be the investigation custody. And at the end of this investigation detention period, the public security organ or other investigation agencies will conclude a case file and file them with a document called Opinions on Prosecution. 起诉意见书 with the corresponding procuratorate. This very legal document is not supposed to be seen by the detainee, therefore I cannot give an illustrated example of it, just knowing that it exists. This has marked that your case is now moving to the next stage, the so-called examination and prosecution period, which according to Article 34, 173 and 174 of the criminal procedure law is a period for the prosecution organ to, to examine your case and draft an indictment. The prosecution organ shall notify you that your case has been entered this phase within three days after receiving the case file from the public security organ by a formal document that looks like this. The Shu notice of the term of examination and prosecution, and some absolutely useless document that looks like this. This is the Notice of rights to appoint defenders or apply for legal aid during the examination and prosecution period. These two will come together. Your family or your lawyer should receive these notices with almost the same content, just with a different designation at the beginning. It is worth noticing that since the beginning of this E and R period, your lawyer will finally be able to wheel your case files. And if you, as our Johnson, that has been trapped in the unfortunate parallel universe that he was charged with the state security crimes, or if your case is considered that involving terrorist activities, or, which I certainly do not hope you are, but if you or your accomplice in the same case that might face life imprisonment or the death penalty, then, according to Article 21 of Criminal Procedure Law, your case will be transferred to an intermediate procuratorate to be examined and prosecuted by them. And this, this will normally happen just in a few days' time after your case finishes the comprehensive investigation period and is transferred to the lower prosecution organ. A notice that, similar to this one shown here, might be sent to you. Although, for the first time ever, this is not a notice that mean to be sent to you. I cannot recount vividly what this notice exactly looks like. It should be something like this, but according to my searches on the internet, I cannot find one to compare. And this one is actually not for you, as it written on the paper. This is used for the upper procuratorate. Yet, I did remember that some detainees received something like this. And with this period, this ENR period furthers, the prosecution organ shall find a chance to interrogate you in the detention center. The Tishen here comes again, which is often called Ejian among the detainees, the second round of interrogation of the procuratorate. During the interrogation, the procurator shall hear your opinions, reconfirm the details of your case, and ask you if you want to plead guilty. If you have accomplices, this would probably be the only time before the court hearing that you may meet with each other. 
So if you agree to plead guilty, they will let you sign the declaration on pleading guilty and accepting the punishment. 认罪认罚拒绝书 and then they will tell you their suggested sentence verbally. If you choose not to plead guilty, then the suggested sentence will not be told, and you of course be expected to receive a longer sentence. The signing of the declaration on pleading guilty and accepting and accepting the punishment, according to law, will require your lawyer or any lawyer on duty, 值班律师 inside the detention center to be present with you. And there's a field that can only be filled out by your lawyer or any other lawyers on site. But in reality, the field left for your lawyer to sign. Will often be signed already when the paper is prepared by someone that you have no idea who they are. And when I asked the prosecutor who came to interrogate me who that guy was, they just said something like, "Oh, your lawyer cannot be reached, and we cannot find any lawyer on duty at this detention center. So we asked our lawyer to sign this line for you." And At the end of this period, the prosecution body will draft the indictment against you and file the case with the court. But is it really that simple? <laughs> of course not. If so, why would I leave such a big space there? Right? The E and R period should normally last for one month, but it can be extended. For 15 days under Article 172 of the Criminal Procedure Law, and your case can be returned to the Public Security Organ for supplemental investigation twice, according to Article 175. Each may last up to one month, and then be resubmitted to the Prosecution Organ for E and R for the same term limit, one month, with 15 days of possible extension. Although it varied from place to place, but as far as I know, this practice of using these lawful extensions and returnings to procrastinate was once widespread, so common that nearly every case will go through this ping-ponging everywhere, and it was called 三减两退 or 三进两退 or 三延两退 With all means that three examinations, two returnings. It's not a formal name of this practice, just what is being called in the detention center. That is according to what I once heard of. It has become less prevalent since late 2019 or early 2020. In the place where I was detained, some told me that restrictions were issued from the very top to prevent this mechanism from being abused. But as far as I can gather from other sources, it is still the very case in many places, especially when you are in a large city with a large population. And if your case is to be prolonged this way, you should receive some documents at this point. This one is the 延长审查起诉期限通知书 notice of extension of the term of examination and prosecution. And this is a recalculation notice. 重新计算审查起诉期限通知书 notice of recalculation of the term of examination and prosecution. Finally, the indictment against you is over and ready, and、uh, but you still cannot receive it yet, and that is because the burden of sending the indictment to the defendant. Falls on the court, not the prosecution. And according to Article 186 of the Criminal Procedure Law, as long as the court sends the indictment to you, the detainee, by or before as late as ten days before the court hearing, it is legitimate. So theoretically, you might only receive the indictment as late as this point. The wait. Before the court hearing might be a tedious long one, although according to Article 208 of the Criminal Procedure Law, the court, upon receiving the case, 
shall normally reach a decision on the case within two months, with a maximum time limit of three months at the latest. And that means a judgment shall be made by this point. Not only the court hearing shall be held, and only if the defendant or defendants of the case may face the death penalty, or if the case has an incidental civil dispute attached. Upon the approval of the upper court, the time limit may be extended for another three months. But in reality, some may even wait for years for the court hearing to be held. For example, one of my cellmates, a drug dealer, sighed one day at dusk in late 2020 and complained that he had already received his indictment for the whole year long, and yet the court seemed to have forgotten him. I later learned that he got his first judgment on the very last day of 2021. Which indicates that he had waited for over two years for his case to be heard by the primary court. But how on earth could this be possible? Are those courts able to just flout the law to such an extent? Well, actually, no. And here comes Article Two Hundred Six of the Criminal Procedure Law that, for Circumstance Number Four, if Out of force majeure, the proceedings in court can be discontinued for as long as they want, and at this stage, the court should issue a notice that looks very much the same as this one we have already seen it at the very beginning. Only that the issuing body will become the court, and other elements that will change accordingly, including the citation, the dates. And the reason will be filled with, of course, here it's force majeure. But in most cases, actually almost all cases, this notice will not be sent, and you just be kept waiting and waiting and waiting. Fortunately, the indictment will often not be delayed for so long, even though it can lawfully be. In most cases, you receive the indictment against you within a few months. From the date that the prosecution composed it, or as is in my case, just the field is longer than one month, and this is what it would look like the indictment, 起诉书 But I won't go into the details of it. It mainly contains that in the first part, the background of you, the defendant, and your case. When were you captured, detained, formally arrested, and when did the file case that. Were transferred to the prosecution, and were there any three e two hours and other things like that? Then moving on, it will state the details of the crime you have committed, but it won't go too far into the details if your case is a political one. Once upon a time, back in a couple of years ago, not long before actually, there will be details, quite a lot actually, that there will be listed in those indictments and judgments. And those documents were quite interesting to read, if you can find one. But starting from 2020, I reckon they suddenly realized that those charges were absurd. Those crime facts they ascertained were far too farcical to be considered as crimes, and they eventually disillusioned themselves and realized that they would better keep those vivid details to themselves and not write it down in the document. So since then, the indictments and the judgments of political cases are generally very brief and dull, leaving the description of the crimes very weak, just like this one. And after the vaguely described crime facts, the indictment will then conclude itself with a very simple list of the evidence, and then goes into formality sentences in conclusion, like. Circumstances were severe, and therefore the prosecution, on behalf of the state, shall present the case to the court. And this time, you and your lawyer or your family will definitely receive it with the exact copies like this, not with any slightest difference. And now we finally come to the court hearing, 
Since you probably signed the declaration to plead guilty, there's not very much you can do at court. Otherwise, they strip your this plead guilty status of yours, and then give you a longer sentence. Therefore, even if you have a lawyer, things they can do are very limited. Even if you did not plead guilty and have entrusted your lawyer to do a not guilty defense, your lawyer will probably receive this. <laughs> The, the judge, which can only be heard from this clip, shouted at the defense counsel, You, stand up. I'm not going to reprimand you. What nonsense are you talking about? And here I have another story to tell. It, it's about another cellmate of mine who unfortunately was prosecuted for, for the crime of spreading pornography. He did upload some porn clips to the well-known free porn websites. I reckon you can guess what that was, but I won't refer to it at this place. In which most of them were recorded by himself. Quite a porn star, I have to say. He had reached such a large number of viewers that I can only dream of. The clips he uploaded were not so much, just a dozen or so, and each only lasted for a few minutes. And a little bit background to be told is that the mainland Chinese authorities will launch the special campaign to crack down pornography industry in nearly every year. And he was just an unfortunate guy that was randomly chosen from thousands of porn uploaders. He hadn't made a profit from it, which was good for him, since otherwise the sentencing would certainly be much heavier. But he chose to challenge the prosecution and the court by pleading not guilty. Together with his lawyer, he made a very good defense in court, actually, claiming that his act of uploading porn clips to the website that was set up in the United States has not violated the laws of the US. And since the website has already been blocked by the Chinese authorities, the violation of the Chinese laws would then fall on those who watched them using the circumstantial method, not he who uploaded them. It's quite eloquent and reasonable, right? But you guess what? He received the longest sentence for non-profit spreading pornography that I have ever seen in that area. So the good defense in court might work the other way around. And you shouldn't put your hope in a court hearing in the first place. So after the court hearing, you can now wait for the judgment to arrive. Oh, and forgot to mention that since the pandemic, court hearings are most likely to be carried out through virtual courts. That is by using something like Google Meet on the internet, but it definitely won't be Google Meet since it was blocked long before. And that affects the proclamation of judgment too. In the past, the court may choose to proclaim judgment at court, which means that you will once and again be put in full harness and be taken to the court to hear the judgment read out. But now the judgments are, in most cases, sent to the detention center, which for this time might be the only time, actually, that a legal document that will arrive on time. And this is what a judgment will look like. Pan jue shu. Similar to the indictment, it will first introduce your background and the progress of your case. If you have a defense counsel, your counsel's information will be listed below. And what comes after that, what comes after that differs. Here, what I mocked is actually the simplified judgment. I cannot find the regulations that justify this sort of practice, but I do come across many, if not too many, that are carried out in this should be informal format. That is, informal judgment layouts or composings. The next part should be what the prosecution charges the defendant. And then comes the part of the defendant's justification and the opinions of the defenders. Only after that should it come to what the court has ascertained. But in this simplified form, the part of the court ascertained facts comes right after the first part, the background. 
It must have some regulations in the court system that approve such a format, since there are many judgments that are written in this way. And following that, you will have 10 days to consider whether or not to appeal. And since the prosecution organ will, in most cases, also appeal if you dare to appeal, that is, which will bypass the Article 237 of the Criminal Procedure Law, making the heavier sentence possible. A large portion of defendants will choose not to appeal after receiving their first instant judgment, and if you do decide to appeal, the judgment that comes from the lower court will almost definitely won't be overturned directly by the upper court, and in most cases, there won't be another court hearing at all. For that, the upper court will only issue a decision, telling you that your appeal has been rejected, or in some cases, telling you that your case is to be retried at the original court. If it is in the latter case, you are in the hope of having a lighter sentence, since that means that the upper court is not pleased with the lower court's judgment. The reason why they won't just overturn it is that doing so will have some adverse effects on the lower court's performance. It will cause them to lose credit in a way. So the, the reissued first instant judgment that come after the retrial can still be appealed once, and by this time the upper court cannot just return the case to the lower court again. The upper court may still choose to issue a decision to reject your appeal, or make some changes to the first instance judgment with the decision, or they might form a court hearing and then issue the second instance judgment, and that will be the true final judgment. Now, after all is done and dusted, no, there's one more thing, the execution order. Uh, that does not mean that you will be executed, but the sentence can only be fulfilled after the execution order is released. The execution order is issued to the detention center, not you. And it will normally come days or a couple of weeks after the judgment becomes final. But some may have to wait for a longer time for their execution order to be released for unknown reasons, which will upset them. Now they can be called convicted criminals, because they want to be transferred to prison faster. Not only that, prisons tend to have better environments and conditions than the detention centers, but also that if they've got a long sentence to serve, the earlier they can go to prison, the longer commutations they can get. And once your execution order is released, if the rest of your sentence is longer than three months, you will be transferred to the prison in batches. If you've got accomplices, you'll probably not be transferred with them in the same batch. You will be transferred to one of the prisons that located anywhere in your provincial division, not necessarily in your local prefecture or city. And if you are considered to be one of those mob forces or local despots, the Hei you'll probably even be transferred to prisons outside your province, like if you are in the southern part of China, you'll be transferred to the far north, or vice versa. This very step, the transfer into prison, is called Xia Jian, or Tou Lao, with the same meaning in different ways of speaking. The first one is tumble down to prison, and the second one is being thrown to prison. Once you've arrived in prison, there will be a month or so that you'll be put in something that is called Ru Jian Dui, the brigade for newcomers. In there, there will be utterly strict rules and extremely harsh conditions, even worse than in the detention center. But after that one month or so of misery, you'll be leading a relatively tranquil life in prison. Commutations and paroles can be expected if you work hard and carefully avoid being involved in any fighting or other rule-breaking activities. However, political offenders will normally not be paroled, nor will they get commutations. And if the rest of your sentence is less than three months, you'll be transferred to a special sector inside the detention centers that is called Xiao Lao Gai, 
the small pen on labor sector, where you'll be responsible for some in detention center duties, like pulling the water tank to fill in the basins of every cell that used to contain drinking water. Life in the Xiaologe sector will be remarkably better than that of months of years you have spent before. But that will be the topic of our next episode, which will focus on the life inside the detention center. And at long last, you are released. Released from the small prison to the grand prison of mainland China. You receive your last document, including the release certificate, which in my case looks like this. The Xing Man Shi Fang Zheng Ming Shu Certificate of Release After Serving a Full Term. And if you are to be released from prison, the release certificate will look like this. It's simply just Shi Fang Zheng Ming Shu Certificate of Release. And there will be other documents. Uh, uh, along with this certificate, but that differs from place to place, and uh, it's very irregular. So let's back on this whole timeline and do some calculations before we finish this episode. So if you are pretty lucky to have every step of this unfortunate adventure that carried out on time, with no unnecessary or uncommon delays. Then how long will it take for the criminal case under the normal procedure to come to the end of being transferred to prison or Xiaolongai? Well, at first, let's assume that you would only be interrogated for one day, since your case is very simple and you are very cooperative. And the next day, your detention warrant is issued, which marks the beginning of your thirty days of criminal detention. And then seven days of requesting for an arrest warrant period follows. Right after that, two months of investigation detention with no extensions. Good. So let's say it lasts sixty-one days, and another month of E and R period, no delay to how fortunate you are. So there's another thirty days, and you only waited two months for the court hearing, and the judgment came two weeks later. Which is another sixty-one days and fifteen days. You, and you are pleased with your sentence and choose not to appeal. Therefore, after another ten days of time, your judgment becomes final. And let's say your execution order comes just one week later, so that's another seven days. To sum up, that's one plus thirty plus seven plus sixty-one plus thirty plus sixty-one plus fifteen plus ten plus seven, which equals to two hundred and twenty-two days. Which is almost seven and a half months. Therefore, if your final sentence is under one year or so, or even under two years, I might say, you probably end up serving your full term inside detention centers. Trust me, if your sentence is two years long, they will have the ability to procrastinate your criminal procedure to over one and a half years. And especially, it is the case when you are a political offender. The chance of you being transferred to prison to have your own bed and can buy your own books in a monthly manner will be extremely slim if you receive the sentence under two years. And there are other types of procedures that can be applied to a criminal case: the simple procedure, 简易程序 or even quick decision procedure, 速裁程序 But they are used in cases like drink driving or stealing, with the ill-gotten value under a very low threshold. And what if your case is quite complicated, and many of the extensions that can be used are used in your case? How long will it take for your case to be concluded in this case? So let's see that you've been interrogated for let's see. One whole week before your detention warrant arrived, and after the thirty-seven day period, you are transferred to a secret place to be put under RSDL for another six months, and after that you are arrested. And with three months of investigation detention passed, you faced another dreadful lengthy three E two R of another six months. And after that, your indictment finally arrived, and you have waited and waited 
and waited for one whole year for the court hearing, and the judgment came two months later. And you are not pleased. You've decided to appeal, and that's another eight months of waiting with a decision from the upper court. Counseling your first judgment and ordering the original court to retry your case, and that is another nine months passed. Your case was retried, and a new judgment came one month later. And you choose to appeal once again, and this time, after another eight months of waiting, your appeal is heard at the upper court, with a final judgment coming two months later. You still have to serve. Another month has passed, and your execution order finally arrived, and you will be transferred to a prison in the next batch next month, which will be twenty days later. So that's seven plus thirty-seven plus one hundred eighty-three plus ninety-two plus one hundred eighty-three plus three hundred sixty-five plus sixty-one plus two hundred forty-four plus two hundred seventy-four plus another thirty plus two hundred forty-four plus sixty-one plus thirty and plus twenty, which equals to one thousand eight hundred and thirty-one days, and that's slightly more than five years. And to bear in mind that this is not a simulation of extreme circumstances, I myself met one who had already been detained for five and a half years in the detention center, and he had not yet heard his final judgment. And one in the neighboring cell was said to have been detained for almost nine years in the detention center, which marks him to be the longest detained one that we've ever heard of. Thanks for watching today's episode, and I have already failed the challenge of finishing this episode in one hour. I hope it will be helpful if you ever need this piece of information. In the next episode, I will talk about life inside a detention center in mainland China. So the question is, what do you want to know about? Please leave your questions below, and I will explain them in the next episode. It might take a very long time to make it, since I have already spent a very long time in making this one. It's about a month or so. And、uh, I need a little period of time to rest. And another reason is that since there will be many illustrative pictures that need to draw, and drawing is my one weakness. So,、um, see you next time.